Welcome to everybody that's joined us today. This is the second episode of Novocase Kickstart webinar and it's been supported by Kalida. I'm Kavita Cooper. I am the Managing Director of Novocase Procurement Solutions. And today we're going to be sharing some top tips and thoughts from the world of procurement, accountancy and IT. Now our panellists are Adam Pritchard, who is the Managing Director of Linford Gray Associates, an accountancy firm that specialises in cloud accounting and also Harold Crew, who is from Innovate IT, and they're experts in professional IT support. Um, it is a great pleasure to be sharing the platform with two other organizations that also offer outsource solutions, and I'm sure they both agree that there is no better time to outsource than today. Now, before we start, I would like to introduce our sponsor, um, Jason, and he is the founder and owner of Leader. So Jason, can I hand over to you, and you can tell us a little bit about your platform? Yeah, sure, good morning to you all. Um, I'm Jason Roberts, the founder of Collider International, and ultimately, we're a B2B marketplace for both public and private sector tenders. Um, we specialize in connecting the buyers, the procurement buyers within organizations to the B2B suppliers of those organizations who actually sell products and services. So there's been a massive move, particularly for organizations to focus and strategize on identifying um, supply diversity or organizations that um, can provide a competitive bid or perhaps some innovative solutions that can help provide a compelling, uh, competitive, and differentiating customer experience. By helping to connect suppliers uh, to buyers, we hope to be able to, bre we hope to, be able to bridge that gap um, that is often difficultly, difficult to get overcome uh, when, when buyers are trying to find suitable uh, providers out there in the marketplace. So it's great to be part of this, this panel today and part of this team. Um, it's great to see businesses starting up and particularly in a difficult um, period of the economy, um, encouraging everyone to, to, to reach out and sponsor and to uh, support each other. So great to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. And before we go on, I'd say that we do use Kalida and um, we would highly recommend um, going and checking it out as well. Right. OK, so today's running order is going to start with Adam and covering off the accountancy. Then we're going to go to Harold for IT and then I'll be wrapping up with procurement. Uh, we'll keep the questions to the end. Um, hopefully, if I don't talk too much, uh, we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes for those. If you have any questions as we go along, pop them in the chat uh, and then we can also raise your hand at the end. Um, there are a couple of polls, um, so please do get involved in these. And if you've got any issues, Beth in marketing is also on the call, so you can just drop her a private message. Right, so let's go to Adam. Adam, if you're, if you're ready, let's hand over to you. So thank you for your kind introduction. My name is Adam Pritchard. I'm a Chartered Certified Accountant and the proud owner and managing director of Linford Great Associates. Uh, we are cloud-based advisory-led accountants that work exclusively on the Xero platform. We're gold certified Xero partners and we were uh, very honored earlier this year to be one of just three finalists for Xero's national award of, for practitioner of the year, which we're super duper proud of. So what does it mean to be a cloud-based advisory-led accountancy practice? Well, uh, first and foremost, it means that we leverage technology uh, for, the, for additional value for clients. And so uh, we design, implement, and execute on technology infrastructures that push data through the pipeline and deliver meaningful real-time insights uh, to help businesses uh, make optimal decisions. Okay, so whilst that sounds like, you know, has very little context and sounds a little bit like jargon, I'm going to move on and we're going to talk about three, the three biggest client problems that we face uh, and how we execute our strategy and our philosophy to solve those issues. Okay, so the first one is how do, how do we, how does a business access meaningful data about the performance and position of their business in real time? And what kind of questions should they be, should they be able to answer in order to drive growth uh, in their business and achieve their corporate and personal ambitions? The second one is establishing an open and transparent dialogue with your account that goes beyond compliance and cost. And wrapped up in that is uh, really a shift in the paradigm of how we think about relationships with accountants and turning it from something where we're you know, uh, making a grudge purchase uh, and incurring a cost to in fact making an, making an investment and seeing a return. Okay, and, the, and finally we'll talk about how we implement that change or how we start with the right infrastructure and that will depend on whether you are starting up and you know, kick-starting something or whether you are restructuring in a post-pandemic era, okay? So what does real-time information mean? Well, it means that you should have answers to questions to things like, how much profit did I make last month? How much profit am I making year to date? What does that mean for my tax liabilities corporately and personally? How much money can I take out of the business? How much cash do I need to accrue? 
Uh, am I taking too much money out of the business? Do I have an overdrawn loan account? All those types of questions. And if you don't have answers to those questions, then they should be red flags in the business. And you should be talking to your accountant or a provider and saying, well, how do we push the data through the pipeline? What do we need to do to get answers to those questions so we can drive growth and, and, and the success in our business? Okay, and once you've got those basic questions answered, uh, you should then be looking at moving further than that and saying, okay, well, I'm about to take on a new hire or launch a new product line. What's my core cash target? How efficient am I? What are my margins? And if I add X amount of top line revenue, how does it filter through my business? And what does that mean to me on the bottom line? What are the variables that affect that efficiency? And how can I improve them? And how sensitive is my business to those variables? And really importantly, something that we focus on quite a lot is what does the future look like? What does next month look like? What does it look like six to 12 months down the line? And if I've made X amount of profit, uh, why can I only see Y amount of cash? Okay, and then everybody's favorite, that allows you then to sort of talk about everybody's favorite questions, like how do I minimize my tax liabilities? Uh, and how do I create long-term wealth or at least strategize to create that wealth? Okay, so we'll move on now. We'll talk briefly about the obstacles to that. Uh, and the tip of the iceberg is the accountant. The first person everybody loves to blame uh, when, it, when it goes wrong. But in my experience, uh, actually what you're dealing with when you don't have those uh, systems and processes in place is, is an underlying problem. And we're just going to talk briefly about two of those things, which really is the enthusiasm and the education. Okay, so when you're uh, developing a tech stack or you're engaging with an account that has a tech stack, that aims at delivering those solutions and those processes. You have to be enthusiastic about what you're doing. You have to have a buy-in from for, at the senior level because that change is implemented from the top down. Okay, and at the same and in this, at the same time, you have to be engaged in understanding how that tech services the interests of your business, how it works, and in understanding how it works, you will understand the variables that affect the quality of the information and what information comprises your financial reports okay next up is outdated solutions they're a huge obstacle so if you're working with an accountant and you're sending him a file of invoices or receipts or you're doing it at the end of the back quarter or you're not getting your information until seven months after the year end that is going to really inhibit your ability to make optimal decisions and to drive your business and your success forward and then finally when we've talked touched upon it briefly it's the existing paradigm I mean, when you think about your accountant, you can't help but think of, this, of somebody that is old, gray, boring, and beaten down by life. And that's just not the case anymore, really. Uh, your accountancy practice should really look as, almost as much like a fintech and a content media production house as it does an accountancy practice. It's a dynamic space, the landscape has changed, and we shouldn't be involved in this vicious cycle where we search out the lowest cost, get the least value, and, and then search out the lowest cost again because we can't see the value. Uh, and a lot of what we do at Linford Gray is we emphasize and, and really prove to clients that if you invest in us and you value that relationship, you will see a return, okay? So what are the solutions? Well, there's tons of solutions and your accountant should be knowledgeable enough about the space and the tech and what's going on in the world to lead you to those solutions. But your accountant will also have a number of solutions in place that will drive you from the, from the bottom of that mountain right to the top of that mountain, the top of that mountain being success uh, and the achievement of your corporate and personal ambitions. And so at Linford Gray, what we focus on is automation, communication, data processing, communication, reporting, communication, uh, and then the identification of uh, opportunities for growth in your business. And we do that using a number of uh, technology applications and, and, and third-party software that all integrates and creates seamless workflows that reduce the uh, distance between the business owner and their numbers, brings everybody closer together in a relationship that adds value at every, at every level. And that's how we sort of take our clients to the top of that mountain. Okay, so what, what, what are the things that you can do? And this is sort of you know, wrapping up everything that we've just spoken about. Well, you can pick the right person to look after you. That's really, really important. Uh, for me, I always like to work with people that are hungry, uh, that are dynamic, that are ambitious, that are excited, that inspire me, that, that make me want to be better. And so it's really important that you pick the right person to look after you. The second one, again, we've talked about it briefly, is invest. Uh, 
we have prospects come to us and some clients that will say to us, well, I've, I've spoken to four or five different people and somebody's quoting me 70 pounds and other people are quoting me 500. And so, you know, I asked them the, to do a sort of a common sense check and ask themselves, well, what would you do for 99 pounds a month? And if it isn't manage the payroll, the VAT returns, statutory accounts, personal self-assessments and management information, then you shouldn't really expect uh, an accountant to do it all for 99 pounds a month. And in fact, he won't. You will end up always feeling like you're being shortchanged and not getting the value. So, you know, uh, shift that paradigm, invest in that relationship, understand what your service level requirement is, agree it with your accountant and understand how he's going to deliver it and how, and how he's going to communicate that value. And the next thing is once you have gone to the trouble of aligning that expectation and agreeing it with your accountant, then hold his feet to the flames. And that sort of, you know, sort of rolls into the fourth one. It isn't difficult anymore to move. The best thing about cloud, uh, cloud accountancy is that if your accountant isn't delivering, if you don't have the answers to those questions that we need, if you're not driving growth or success, then changing your accountant is as easy as changing your software subscription. You just say, I want to change. They, they hand the software subscription over and they send a professional clearance letter. Now, if there are big holes in your information because your account, your, your account hasn't done a very good job for you, then yeah, that might cost you a little bit of money getting it up to date, but it isn't difficult to move. So hold your provider accountable and don't be afraid to move. Okay. And that sort of sums up everything that, 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 that we've been talking about. And that is how we at Linford Gray uh, would suggest that people get to grips with moving from either desktop solutions into the cloud or starting a new business in a post pandemic era and want to move into the cloud space. And the sort of tech stack that, that you should be developing and the questions you should be asking of your account in order that you can get that information uh, and make those decisions that will drive the business forward. Okay, so uh, if you found that interesting, oh, there we go, don't be afraid to move. If you found that interesting, we can connect. Uh, you can get me at adam at linfordgray.co.uk. Uh, you can get me through our website at linfordgray.co.uk or you can book a discovery session where we can have a half an hour one-to-one -one chat and you can book that directly uh, into my calendar from my Calendly link. Okay, I'm hanging around for questions and answers. Uh, and so it's been great to chat to you and I hope you've found some value in that. And I'll hand back, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back to Kavita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. That's, that was really interesting and um, I look forward to the questions at the end. So now we will move over to Harold. So Harold, if you're able to share your screen, um, we'll hand over to you and hear about the world of IT. Perfect. So hi guys, uh, thanks for joining again. Uh, my name is Harold Carew and I work for Innovated IT. Effectively, um, I have experience within the telecommunications field um, where I have uh, experience working and providing services um, to uh, customers um, that are typically SMEs and also non-profit organisations around the four pillars of IT, uh, which is internet, your cloud, your voice and your cybersecurity um, solutions uh, that keep you protected. Um, currently working for Innovated IT, who are an outsourced IT provider, um, who provide 24-7 support, effectively providing peace of mind as a service. So the problems that I'm going to discuss today um, is about um, the adjustment, um, the things that are happening in the world because of COVID, people working from home. Uh, some businesses are ready and some businesses um, are not ready. Um, so we want to talk about making um, your working environment for your staff appropriate. Also want to talk about cybersecurity threats, uh, specifically around ransomware attacks um, on the rise in the last six months. Uh, and then I want to talk about the three things you shouldn't do when it comes to procuring IT. So to start with, the IT environment. So um, some businesses um, will be, as I said, having staff working from home. Um, effectively, you need to do um, make sure that the physical environment is suitable for the staff working from home. Uh, so that's effectively by doing a workplace assessment with your staff members uh, to make sure that they do have the right hardware. So if they was using desktops in the office before, they have laptops, uh, keyboards if needed, mouses, appropriate chairs, 
um, also like desk height as well, um, somewhere where they can actually work efficiently. Um, some uh, businesses, um, the staff members might want an external monitor um, as that could be proven to enhance productivity. Uh, protecting your work environment. So uh, kind of touching in this kind of security element here as well. Uh, if you do have staff members that do say they go to the pub, the Starbucks, um, they connect to effectively public Wi-Fi, um, there can be threats um, from their traffic being hacked. Um, so by having a secure DNS solution, um, effectively what this does is it redirects um, the user's web traffic uh, through a cloud-based DNS security solution. Uh, businesses can enforce web access policies to ensure regulatory compliance um, and this can stop up to 88% of threats to the network edge. Now, cybersecurity um, and ransomware. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of attacks have been on the rise um, since COVID um, has happened and people have gone to working from home. Um, and this effectively is putting businesses at risk. Um, staff members are down downloading viruses, etc. Now, ways that people are using that is they are using the trigger word COVID, um, whether it's they're sending out fake um, new COVID guidelines uh, internally, they'll use your branding, they'll make it look like it's come internally. Your staff mem members will download the new COVID guidelines and effectively um, put your estate at risk. Now, um, the extreme end of this is if you there is a ransomware attack, which is a virus will, that will actually lock your files away. Um, you won't have access to your files as a business and somebody will come knocking um, asking for you to pay them uh, a hefty fee uh, for them to release your files back to you as a business. Typically, they'll ask for it in cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin. Now, the solution for that is pretty simple. Um, Innovated IT have been providing this to a lot of clients recently, um, which is effectively having email spam filter such as Barracuda email, or Sentinel, now this can literally be between three to seven uh, pounds per user per month. As you can see, there's gonna be similar prices on there just to give you an indication. Um, but endpoint detection, response antivirus, uh, third party backup. Um, now Microsoft themselves suggest that you have a third party um, to back up your, um, your estate and also G Suite. They won't take responsibility um, and also any um, data that's deleted and, and that has gone undetected for 30 days or more um, is actually permanently, de de uh, permanently deleted. Uh, so by having some sort of third party backup uh, provided and by an IT supplier, that will keep you secure and you will know that you have access to that um, data. Um, now, finally, um, a lot of businesses um, invest in technology, but they don't invest in the people. Now, 80% of incidents um, could have actually been prevented by training of people um, rather than just the investment in the technology. So what there is available, what we look to provide um, our clients is cybersecurity awareness courses. Now, it, sounds, it doesn't sound like the most exciting thing, but um, what effectively you do is you are able to actually fish your own business. So you'll be sending these same messages that the attackers will be emailing your staff. You'll be sending that and disguising that. So Netflix reset password is one uh, example there, but you could effectively tailor the message. So we would suggest like COVID um, based messages um, and you can actually track, get some analytics around who's actually clicking on this. Uh, you will be able to identify which users are more vulnerable, which users are gonna need more training um, and um, and hopefully that will then prevent them clicking on the real viruses when they do come. Now, three things you shouldn't do when procuring IT. So um, to start with, um, buying different brands, models of hardware, laptops, etc. Now, effectively, um, by doing this, it makes it a lot com more complicated to actually resolve issues. So if there was repairs that needed to be done, there's no spare stock um, because you might have to order it in for each specific device um, and also the greater user experience of your staff in terms of getting used to one uh, product or uh, one laptop model, etc. cetera. Um, the example of this is if you had cars, you had 20 cars, uh, if they were all the same car, 
uh, your staff gets used to driving that car. Um, if there's a problem with that car, you've got spare parts that can easily go back onto that car. So hopefully uh, that's one way of looking at it. Now, in regards to buying licenses, a lot of people go to Google, they go on to Microsoft, they go to G Suite, and they just try to purchase licenses. Um, so, um, but yeah, so effectively, um, a lot of people, what they do is they just go straight to the vendors. Um, but what by going to an IT provider, we've got partnerships with these vendors where we're able to pass on discount savings based on the amount of um, kind of users that we purchase on the behalf of. Uh, so we can, on average, save at least 10% um, in terms of purchasing these licenses on your behalf. So any questions about any licenses that you've got, please give me a, a message and I can check that we... Uh, can do that as well for you. Now, the final uh, thing that you shouldn't do is digging for funds. So a lot of the times we run into clients um, that um, have issues or they need to make upgrades and um, there's always a panic around um, being able to afford um, being able to afford these services or these crucial critical um, resources. Um, so I'm just going to move across and say that effectively, oh, you should have an IT budget as a business. Um, so typically, 4% uh, of your business revenue um, is spent on IT. Now, this does vary across your industry. Um, some industries more, some industries less. And as you can see, there's a breakdown there of what typically within that 4% um, it is spent on. Now, at Innovated IT, we're happy to help um, do this exercise with you guys. Uh, we've got some pre-filled templates uh, to be able to run this through, but it is crucial that businesses have IT budget. Um, a lot of businesses don't have, and they really do need it. Now, as I mentioned, um, happy for you to guys to reach out to me in terms of my details. They should be coming up now. So my email address is there, and then my LinkedIn is there as well. So look, look forward to you guys reaching out to me. And um, remember to not procure in those methods that I have mentioned. Thank you. As I've already mentioned, and hopefully most of you know, I'm Kavita Cooper and I am the MD of um, Novake Procurement Solutions. And our vision is to redefine procurement and make it exciting. So hopefully the next 10 minutes or so, I can, uh, we can really get you excited about what we do. <laughs> now, many organisations, um, as we know, are in a really challenging time at the moment. Revenue isn't where we forecasted it in January, and there's probably very little light or no light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to sales. Um, there's big gaps in numbers, and many organisations are really struggling to keep their heads above water. So they're looking to save money, um, looking to the best place to save money and improve those efficiencies. So the priority really is around those quick wing tactical opportunities. So the key question is, where is the best place to start? Now, whilst I think most people, or I think the tendency is to go, okay, well, let's look at the top spend suppliers and let's negotiate the really big numbers. Actually, that's really a quick process. Typically, those suppliers are already in contracts. They're delivering key services, uh, which means they can't be easily changed or turned off. Or, and, and it is quite a struggle to actually get some traction there. So our recommendation is to look at the other end of the scale and focus on what we term tail expenditure. So what is tail? Now, tail spend is typically 80% of your suppliers, uh, which is around 20% of your expenditure. Now, it usually comes under the threshold of control, so it isn't normally managed, um, it's probably quite a mess, and I have to be honest, most uh, strategic procurement people will, will really try to avoid it. But it is absolutely the place to go if you want to find those quick savings. Now, it's really important to mention that tail spend can sometimes contain some hidden risks. Um, which can take you down a bit of a rabbit hole. So for example, you may only be spending a few thousand pounds on a particular supplier, but that supplier may be delivering you services which require a transfer of personal data. Now, um, as we know, because of ICO regulations, that would mean you would need some agreement, uh, agreement uh, uh, you would need an agreement in place, um, either because they are the data processor or sub-processor. So um, it can highlight that those um, agreements are needed and that they should be in place. So back to tail, um, how do you actually start? Where do you start? Well, like any procurement process, um, you really ought to start with a spend analysis. And that's to determine the type of spend you have and really then decide on the best and most suitable approach to move forward with. 
Um, spread analysis can be done internally um, and it can take some time or you can use a, a third party supplier. If you use a third party supplier, make sure again that you have the right agreements in place because there may be a transfer of personal data within that tail expenditure. Particularly if people are buying things um, for themselves or they're submitting some kind of expenses which can pop up in your tail spend. So we would recommend an, an approach called um, SMC, which is a stop, move and continue. Um, stop. Now stop is, is what it says, is <laughs> identifying those suppliers that you may have not worked with for a period of time and you don't want to use anymore. So you want to stop using those. Um, typically would say 12 months is a, is a good period of time to leave before you start switching those organizations off, um, particularly if they've been used in an ad hoc process previously. You also want to find those organizations that you really don't want to be purchasing from. So for example, those that don't align with the values of your organization, um, those that again, maybe ad hoc requirements um, where you don't want people spending money on uh, particular equipment, for example, that you may have a preferred supplier for. And again, when it comes to preferred suppliers, you may want people to use a preferred supplier rather than the organization they're using. We've also seen when you do tail that some people in organizations go to competitors. So again, you may want to look to switch that, um, that supplier off as well. Now, it's really important to work with uh, your finance team on this, because what you don't want to be doing is turning off or stopping access to old suppliers in finance systems um, and then simultaneously having those going back on in the background without the necessary checks so that you're sort of trying to reduce and, and, and whilst it's still growing at the same time. Obviously, that makes absolutely no sense. The next step in stop, move and continue is move. Now, this is the one that can deliver the best opportunities when it comes to savings and efficiencies. Um, and it involves the movement of spend to either a different supplier. So, for example, a preferred supplier or the consolidation of suppliers. And that actually goes back to the poll at the beginning, which I was hoping would be similar to the one on LinkedIn, but obviously it wasn't. Um, the consolidation of suppliers, obviously you can use aggregation to negotiate some really good pricing there. There are also uh, efficiency savings that can come through uh, consolidation of suppliers. Um, there are less uh, organizations to manage uh, and therefore fewer invoices to process. Um, but you can also do other things like putting in place catalogs, uh, running e-auctions, um, along with renegotiation um, of the new suppliers or the suppliers you've chosen through the consolidation process. Uh, and then the final step is continue. And this is where you want to continue working with your supplier, uh, but you now have the opportunity to maybe put in place a formal agreement. Um, so you can use this time to renegotiate uh, costs and terms, for example, payment terms, to make sure that you're in the best position to work with them going forward. So SMC programs can be delivered really quickly, and they can deliver savings, but it is really important to put the right controls and checks in place uh, and the legal agreements um, to mitigate those hidden risks. For a service to deliver true value for money, real value for money, you need to consider a number of factors. Um, most buyers are going to want the best possible quality, as we've seen, and the best possible service. But of course, we want that at the, at the lowest possible price. Now, we do look at servicing quality as common requirements, but there are four others. And as you've seen, those were listed on the poll. Now, when we um, deliver tenders for clients, we do refer to all six of those areas. And what we try and do is determine what are the base needs um, for a client or a stakeholder so that we can go out to market and we can engage with the right parties and the right suppliers to negotiate the best deal and, and follow through a tender process if required. We do this um, by using something called hierarchy of needs, which is loosely based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it allows us to, I suppose, um, uh, weight what's more important um, with something like quality being the most important and then it goes upwards uh, and typically uh, the things at the top are important, but they may not be number one when it comes to um, the requirements. One of the things I should say before I start as well is that you're not going to see ethical values as one of the six. And you'll have noticed that when you did the poll. And that's because ethical values and sustainability should actually fall into each one of these six areas. So let's start with the first one, assurance of supply. So what are you typically looking for? In, and what are we talking about when we, when we mention uh, assurance of supply? Well, you want to make sure that you have the availability of goods and services from your suppliers. You want to make sure that they're financially stable. You want to make sure that their, supply, their own suppliers are financially stable. You want to ensure that they have the, the geographical coverage. 
um, and that they are going out their way to identify any supply chain risk um, in their supply chain also. You want to ensure that they have the capacity and the ability to be able to flex um, and if, if, you, if you're wanting to increase your orders over a period of time. Importantly, you want to make sure that they can deliver and deliver where you want, when you want and how you want. And importantly as well, and this goes back to the ethical piece, you want to know that they have an ethical approach and they demand it of their suppliers and their supply chain. The next on the list is quality. Uh, and this obviously came up as most important on the poll. So this is ensuring that what you're buying is fit for purpose. That if you bought it again and again, it can be re repeatable. It fully meets the spec. It fully meets design quality. It's consistent. It's reliable. Um, for some organizations, you may want to make sure that they have quality management systems in place. And importantly, again, going back to the ethical piece, you want to know that it's been ethically and sustainably sourced, if at all possible. And it could be one of your prerequisites before you even consider working with that organization. The next on the list is services. So this is how services are supplied or how they're delivered. You want to look at things like lead times, response times, flexibility, how proactive they are at delivering their services. Do they have the right processes and procedures in place? Are you getting the right account management and the right support at all the different levels? Are you getting things like escalation paths and, and contract management activities? Are you getting the right MIS reporting, training? There's lots of things to consider in services. And, and I think sometimes it can feel very, um, it, it, people maybe don't go wide enough when it comes to services. So there is lots and lots of things to consider. The next on the list is um, cost. Now this goes beyond just the price of the tin. Of course, it's price related, but also cost covers things like terms and conditions, the charging methodology and the commercials. How would that actually work? Would you include things like a benchmarking clause? What are the payment terms? Um, do you want them longer? Do you want them shorter? What have you um, agreed as an organization that you want to do? Some larger corporates, for example, particularly at this very challenging time, are looking to help smaller organizations by um, improving on their payment terms. You may want to look at whole life ownership costs, the cost of disposal of equipment, um, all of that to take into consideration and how far the supplier will go to help support you with that. Importantly in cost as well, when it comes back to ethics, is knowing that your suppliers are making a profit. You want them to be here. You want them to be able to service you three years down the line. So if you're pushing very hard on them to reduce that profit, you know, that can be a financial concern. And then finally as well, um, within cost is something we look at is whether or not an employer pays at minimum the living wage. Something to consider, again, if it's part of your CSR policy or something you as an organization take um, think is, in, is important. Next we have is innovation. And that covers the continuous improvement to make sure you can do things like reduce cost, considering emerging technology, uh, as Adam mentioned, having sort of that, that, um, that tech stack that's applicable to yourselves, um, automation, having those new ideas, maybe collaboration with other organizations, um, really embracing that sort of transformation and that change. And again, going back to how sustainable are they and, and have they looked at everything they can do to minimize their impact on the environment? And the last one is compliance. And obviously this is legal uh, in, in most situations, but important to, to look at and have on the list. So everything from GDPR, health and safety, uh, modern slavery, anti-corruption, uh, and when it's IT related, the WE Directive, um, which, uh, which, is, which is from the European Union and something we've obviously signed up for to make sure that um, organizations dispose of equipment in an appropriate way. So those are the areas I want to cover and it's incredibly important um, to look at those when you're trying to achieve that value for money and not just look at cost in, in, in its, in, on its own. So the third area I want to cover, and there is no poll to this one, um, and it's last, but it's certainly not least, and that's a little bit about procurement with purpose and the triple bottom line. So if you don't know what the triple bottom line is, it's people, profit, and planning. Now, during lockdown, we all experienced how nature reacted to that human pause button, and I'm sure many of you uh, were really moved when you watched the David Attenborough documentary. I know I certainly was. It pretty much brought me to tears. Now, as we move into this new world, it really is an opportunity for us all to look at how we can make a positive change for both society and the environment. Now, our buying behavior is gonna be absolutely fundamental to this, both as a consumer and as a business. And we hold the power to apply the pressure to companies and demand that change. Now, the procurement profession is a 
and should be leading the way. But even if you don't have procurement in your organization or any kind of buying function, you can still make a difference as an organization while still growing your profits. So I want to share with you three different ways um, that I think you can achieve this. The first one is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, if you're not aware, there are 17 goals uh, and they are a blueprint to how we want to achieve a better and more sustainable future all by 2030. Now, they address um, global challenges, um, including things like poverty, inequality, climate change, environment, um, environmental de degradation, de degrade environmental, peace and justice. Um, now, we at Nova K, we actually support um, goal number five, which is for gender equality, goal number nine, which is for innovation, and goal number 13, which is for climate change. So I suppose the question is, well, how can this actually help your business? Well, as procurement people, we know organizations, when they're looking for potential suppliers, they want to know how are you going to try and achieve your CSR objectives? How are you going to go above and beyond delivering this box standards um, goods and services? Uh, and we've also seen this come up time and time again in, in, uh, in tenders. So aligning your business to these goals and being able to demonstrate your contribution is a fantastic way to help you stand out from the competition. Um, and obviously, it's part of a huge community. You're able to really quickly find out who else is supporting goal number five and what do they do? So would recommend you have a look at that if you haven't already. The second thing is moving away from a, a linear economy to a circular economy. Um, and becoming known for this. So if you don't know what a circular economy is, um, if you go to Wikipedia, and I, I did get this quote very quickly, but uh, a circular economy is an economic system aimed at eliminating waste and the continual use of resources. So continue using stuff for as long as possible um, and try not to dispose of it any earlier than you need to. So let's take three, um, let, let, let's take IT equipment as a bit of an example. And I've got three uh, things and three options you can potentially have. And we recently did do this for a school. The first thing you can do, uh, and this is when you're buying new equipment or looking for new equipment for your organization. You can buy new equipment and at the end of the life of that equipment, you can dispose of it. Now, you may do that through a registered party and we've talked about the WE directive, so it may be recycled uh, and that's great. So you've had the new equipment, you've used it, you've disposed of it. Fine. The second option is when you have new equipment and when you look to replace it, you actually proactively look to pass it on. And that may be to a charity or a non-profit. So it's repurposed, it's, but it's used in, in, in way it should be again. And then the third option is to actually consider in the first instance to purchase refurbished equipment. Now, this is a really fantastic option. Um, if for those of you that are worried, it comes cleaned, um, it comes with warranties. And most importantly, especially when we're looking at bottom line, and this is what we're covering on today's call, it can be up to half the price of new equipment. Um, and at the end of it, you can pass it on. Um, and actually, typically, IT equipment can have up to three life cycles before it's actually disposed of. And the third way, because I'm conscious that I'm talking loads today, is volunteering. Uh, during the lockdown, I had the privilege of working with over 20 fellow procurement professionals, and they were all volunteering their time to help us source PPE. And what's amazing is, although these people are starting to go back to work, they're still supporting these charities. So I've just grabbed some stats. Um, from NCBO, um, and they are 19.4 million people volunteered through like a group or a club or an organization. And that could be like clubs or brownies or youth organizations. And most people have formally volunteered at some point in their lives and they kind of dip in and out of that. However, a tiny small proportion of volunteering actually takes place for employers. In fact, and if it does, it's actually only large organizations. So this is where your business can make a big difference. Um, and an organization that seems to promote and support volunteering is seen as a change maker. It can help improve the retention of employees. It can be attractive to new employees, but it can also go uh, to demonstrate, again, your commitment to wider society. Anyway, so I'm going to wrap this all up. Uh, and to summarize my three top tips for today. Number one, if you want to deliver quick savings, consider doing this through tail expenditure. Number two, if you, want to achieve, if you want to achieve real value for money, fully understand the needs and requirements of your business. And the third one, grab the opportunity to be a leader when it comes to procurement purpose and the triple bottom line. So that's me done. With 15 minutes to go, Beth, you'll be happy with that. Um, and what I will do is I will now open up to questions. So if we can do that, please. Fantastic. 
So we have one question that's come through. This one is for you, Harold. Um, how much does cybersecurity awareness training cost, course cost? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So um, the course would cost £10 per user per month um, or £110 um, if they bought it annually. Um, now, the cheeky way to do it is to get one license and obviously share that information internally um, in terms of the content, the videos, etc. However, it doesn't come with the benefits of the analytics, so you can't actually track it down to the level of each staff member, which is the way the, uh, this, the, the product is meant to be used. Thank you, Harold. Um, an interesting one, Adam, maybe this one's for you. Uh, I'm interested in a bounce back loan. Do you know if anyone's been refused? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Adam. So I personally haven't had anybody refused, uh, but there are, I know of instances where people have been refused and they've typically been sole traders and they've typically been with challenger banks. So, and I, and I do know now that banks, uh, well, if you talk to any sort of brokerage or lender, the banks are not opening accounts. And for instance, Tide, if you were with Tide, uh, there was a period in which they just locked that borrowing down completely because they ran out of funds. Uh, so if you're considering it, I would say, uh, do it very quickly because it also uh, is set to end. Yeah, just to add to that, Kavitra, as well, um, if, if these are new startup companies and haven't yet organised their business banking accounts, business banking accounts have also been locked down pretty much as well because people are trying to open accounts to get access to funds. So mm -hmm. I think there's some compliance that the government has to do on that. So banks will stop that process of opening brand new accounts for the time being. Um, uh, but also, I think banks have also stopped, uh, for the most part, issuing loans as well until there's a top up as such. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another one, I think, for you, for Harold. Um, can ransomware attacks affect Office 365 SharePoint and move uh, between tenants? Yeah, so with a ransomware attack, it is one of the worst uh, kind of forms of attack. So uh, depending on kind of who's behind the ransom or, um, ransomware attack, uh, they can completely infiltrate your system. Um, so to answer that, yes, um, they can really deny access to your services. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Chris Ward. Um, Kavita, due to security, um, IT is regularly a subject of waste, as you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned you can have three times life cycles. Any ideas how to sell multiple life cycles to IT departments you think buying new is important. Well, actually, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to bounce this one to Harold. Harold, um, in your mm. when you're um, putting in place refurbished equipment or kit, um, yeah. how is the best way to position that to IT teams? So typically people don't initially think um, to go for refurbished. Um, what normally happens is when it comes to like budgetary exercises, understanding um, if we're implementing less than a few services, understanding what the most important is. Uh, once we then look at the hardware element, that is the point where we normally suggest, um, okay, well, this is your budget, so how about refurbished? But you do make a good point that maybe it should be led with uh, more often, um, which uh, I guess it, it's not, um, but but yeah, it should. I, I believe it should be led with rather than the thing that is mentioned when there's budgetary issues. I also think, I think Chris, you know, this is a challenge and something we talk about in procurement quite a lot, but I do think that this has to be from the top as well. I think as part of a, as an organization's strategy and its commitment to the circular economy, to doing things differently, it, it needs to come from there. The directive needs to come from the top to say, we need to look at doing things another way. Uh, and actually that, that will help that conversation with, with the IT department, I would say. Um, Adam, a question for you. Do you focus on any specific sectors? Uh, that's an interesting question, really. And I would say that uh, or our niche is sort of availing itself to us. And so I would say that we don't focus on any specific sectors. Instead, what we focus on is uh, leveraging that technology for value across all businesses in all sectors. But it does so happen that uh, we are developing a little bit of a niche around e-commerce businesses, some who also have a physical retail space and amongst pubs, clubs, cafes and bars. Uh, and though that, that, that seems to fit very well with our skill set at the minute. And so those tend to, that, that tends to be where we are. But no, generally we are, we are a general practice uh, and 
our speciality and our focus rather than being a sector or a niche or a niche is what we do. Thank you. There was another question that came through. What percentage of savings can be achieved through tail spend analysis? So um, I would say, obviously, savings aren't going to be achieved through the analysis, but through the activity that, um, that the analysis uh, identifies, the opportunities it identifies. I think that's a difficult question because it depends on your organisation and what that tail spend, what the analysis um, shows you. Um, I would say typically you want to aim for anything between 10 to 15 percent. It could be greater, um, but also some of those costs may be things that you can't change. So unaddressable expenditure. So the analysis will definitely help you identify those. But if you wanted to put finger on the air, I'd say 10 to 15 percent. Are there any other questions there? No? Does any else have anything they would like to ask? We've got a few minutes left. No? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for attending. Um, we will be putting this um, on, um, on demand. So um, if you know of anybody else that would be interested to listen, please do um, send them to the link and we will share it out to everybody that's joined. Thank you again for your time. And hopefully we'll join you. Uh, you'll join us, I should say, <laughs> on the next episode. Um, I think we're doing it on next month. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Thank you, guys. Cheers, guys. Thanks for joining Cheers. us. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.